Please make sure that you are in the Monroe section of your Unit 4 notes. I can describe Monroe's policies during his presidency. Please record this learning target in your notebook. Today we are talking about James Monroe, President number five, and John Quincy Adams, President number six. So give me Mo Monroe and quality with Quincy. So let's talk Monroe first. Monroe is our fifth president of the United States. His vice president is a guy named Tompkins. He serves from 1817 to 1825, meaning that that's two terms that he serves. And he's saying, give me five. I just got elected and I am feeling good. That is a um, hint because we're entering the era of good feelings. Please add these descriptions to your notebook. So let's talk Monroe's domestic policies. These are things happening at home in the United States. All right, so after the War of 1812, we're entering this time period called the Era of Good Feelings. So Monroe's like, ooh, I feel good. Um, this time period is a time period where the Federalist Party is going to completely disappear post War of 1812. So during this time period, Federalist Party goes away because it's no longer cool to be anti-war. The War Hawks were the cool kids on the block. There were very few political differences in America during this time period. This is very rare for our nation's history. This time period favored the development of national programs and institutions, including a protective tariff, internal improvements, and the revival of a Bank of the United States that Jefferson and Madison had tried to throw out. Go ahead and add these descriptions to your digital notebook. All right, so let's talk nationalism once again. Nationalism um, comes on at the end of the War of 1812. Thank you, Battle of New Orleans, for that. America is now seen as a dominant player for world power. We're very united and patriotic. We're very pro-America during this time. The decline of the Federalist Party removed much of the tension in our nation's government. All right, so um, one of the big things that Monroe does during his presidency, during this era of good feelings, is he passes this thing called the adams onis Treaty. Now, this is very easy for him to pass because there's no political tension at this time. So the adams onis Treaty is passed in the year 1819, and Andrew Jackson, remember him from the war, or the Battle of New Orleans, Andrew Jackson goes down and invades Florida, which had belonged to the Spanish at the time, to stop Seminole Raids, which was a Native American tribe. They were raiding um, Georgian land. So we end up getting Florida from Spain with this treaty, and Spain in return gets a solidified border with the United States. So we officially are separating that Louisiana Purchase Territory from the Mexican and Spanish lands um, like Texas, which you saw in Texas history. Go ahead and add this info to your digital notebook. All right, so here's your anchor chart for the adams onis Treaty. We gained Florida, that's Florida, not a dino head, from Spain in the year 1819. All right, so now we have the issue of this state called Missouri that's joining the Union. So Missouri is becoming a state from a territory, but there's an issue of whether or not it's going to join as a slave state or a free state. We can't figure out what it's going to be. So that's because of this major issue called sectionalism with the expansion of slavery. So the northern states wanted to prevent the spread of slavery, and obviously the south is pro-slavery. They want the new, or the new states that are added to be slave states. The reason for this was so they could keep the balance of power in the Senate. Um, Missouri does apply for statehood in the year 1817. At that time, there were 11 free states and 11 slave states in the United States. Missouri would upset the balance of power in the Senate, and the northern and the southern states would both be upset depending on the outcome. So we need to figure out, is Missouri going to be a slave state or a free state? Because it sits right on the border. Well, here's what happens. We compromise. We come up to an agreement um, where Missouri gets to join as a slave state, but Maine, which is up here, would join as a free state. However, after Missouri is added, no newly added land above this green 3630 line could be another slave state. So Missouri gets to be the exception here. Everything after that that's north of this line will have to join as a free state. Northern states do this because they want to prevent the spread of slavery, um, but the southern states still want the opportunity to add new slave states to the United States to keep that balance of power. Go ahead and add this to your notebook.
right? So this is intended to balance the number of slave and free states. All right, so there's a balance here. We're balancing the slave states and the free states with one another. Nothing above the 3630 line could be a slave state. Now we've got multiple landmark Supreme Court cases during Monroe's presidency that we need to talk about. All right, so the first one we need to talk about is McCullough versus Maryland. Then we're going to talk about Gibbons versus Ogden. So uh, during the Monroe presidency, the Supreme Court is going to be extremely busy. Here's what I need you to do. Can you please switch to your Supreme Court cases section of your unit four notes? We will come back to Monroe in just a minute. All right, so McCullough versus Maryland. The state of Mer or Maryland wants to regulate its own taxes. It does not want the national bank that Monroe reinstated regulating those taxes, but the court rules that a state cannot tax a federal institution. Basically what this does is it sets up this thing called the necessary and proper clause. It's also nicknamed the elastic clause. Um, congressional power can expand and stretch beyond what is listed in the Constitution. So if it's not listed in the Constitution, that does not mean that the federal government can't do it if it's not outlawed. Um, and the federal government is going to be more important than the state governments here. Go ahead and add this information to your digital notebook. All right, so the artist here is trying to convey that um, the state governments are not going to be near as powerful as the federal government, but the federal government has the power to carry out any taxes because it's more powerful. So federal government is more important than state government here. Okay, our next one to talk about is Gibbons versus Ogden. All right, so with Gibbons versus Ogden, New York State had issues with preferring certain trade organizations over others. New York tries to regulate interstate commerce. States cannot give preference to trade. No monopolies are allowed. This case establishes the congressional power to regulate interstate commerce or trade across state lines. Congress has power. The states do not. Therefore, the federal government is more powerful once again. Add this to your notebook. All right, so only the federal government is going to be allowed to interstate or to regulate interstate commerce. Once again, the federal government trumps the state government here. Now go back to your Monroe section of your notes. All right, Monroe's foreign policies. Okay, so these are things happening with other countries, specifically with Europe at this time. So um, we have major issues going on in Latin America during this time period. Um, the U.S. feels threatened by these events. A lot of these Latin American countries are rebelling against their European monarchs that ruled them, just like we did back in 1776. So there are rebellions happening literally all over Latin America. They're trying to get independence from their European um, monarchs. So to prevent revolutions, the monarchies were trying to send troops over to fight the Latin rebels. We don't like that because now there's European troops in the West. We get kind of worried because eventually they could be used against us. So here's what we do. We pass this thing called the Monroe Doctrine. So the Monroe Doctrine um, basically talks about how we don't think it's a good idea for Europe to continue to have these chains attaching them to North and South America. So... What we do is we tell Europe, stay out of the West. The U.S. would not allow European colonization in the Western Hemisphere. That's the northern and um, southern parts of America. The U.S. would defend the independence of new Latin American republics. So um, basically, if Europe tries to come over here and fight, we're going to defend Latin America and we're going to send troops. We want those chains to be broken. America would not get involved in European affairs if Europe stayed out of Western Hemisphere American affairs. So we will mess with you if you don't mess with our side of the world, basically. Add this to your notebook. All right, so your Monroe Doctrine, we're telling Europe to stay out of the West. We're breaking the chains that Europe had over the West. And we have an M here for Monroe. Now, switch to your John Quincy Adams section of your Unit 4 notes. And we're flipping around a lot. 
I can describe JQA's policies during his presidency. Add this to your notebook for me. All right, so Monroe leaves the presidency after two solid terms in office. The era of good feelings continues, uh, kinda. For the election of 1824, also known as the corrupt bargain, breaks out. So we have four people running against one another. John Quincy Adams, Jackson, Crawford, and Clay. All four of them are not running against one another, against different parties. It says no parties here. They're really part of the Democratic Republican Party. But the problem is that party is starting to faction off because, again, just because you're all part of the same party doesn't mean you all have the exact same beliefs. Um, so the party's starting to fracture. So we have no majority winner, but Jackson had the most popular vote, which we can see right here. The House of Representatives was left to decide the election, though, because you have to have a majority. He didn't have more than 50 percent, so he did not have a majority. So the House of Representatives decides the election. The second place person, John Quincy Adams, made a deal with last place guy Henry Clay. So John Quincy Adams, this pink bar right here, makes a deal with Henry Clay, this orange bar right here. If Clay drops out and throws his support behind John Quincy Adams, Clay would get to become the Secretary of State, and then John Quincy Adams would have a majority over Jackson. So the election had to be decided in the House. We've got Clay and JQA making their deal. Hey, Clay, if you drop out of the election, I'll make you my Secretary of State when I win. Clay's like, yeah, sounds like a plan. I'll, I'll tell my supporters to vote for you instead. Bet, can't wait. What a bargain. Yeah, Jackson doesn't like this very much because it's going to cause Jackson to lose. Clay's support helps John Quincy Adams secure the presidency. Jackson comes in, he's like, uh, that bargain that you two made was so not fair. You cost me the presidency. You're so corrupt. And he's going to nickname the election of 1824 the corrupt bargain. Andrew, you're just angry because um, you're just angry because you lost. That wasn't illegal. It was totally legal. Totally. Oh, just you wait until 1828. I'm coming for you, Quincy. You haven't seen the last of me. We'll see what happens then later. Dun, dun, dun. So John Quincy Adams gets the presidency. His vice president is Calhoun, and he serves from 1825 to 1829. So he's like, uh, y'all talk so much trash about my dad, John Adams, but I vow to have a much better reputation than him. Um, we'll see. Oh, yeah, that corrupt bargain of mine. Yeah, uh, that was totally legal. So um, make sure you added this info to your digital notebook. All right, let's talk domestic policies for John Quincy Adams. This is going to be a really big one. He establishes this thing called the Erie Canal. The Erie Canal was a canal system that connected the manufacturing centers that were powered by the Great Lakes area because we didn't have, you know, electricity at this point. So water is going to power all these factories where we create and create and create all these goods. And we're going to connect all the way to the Hudson River so we can send our stuff down to New York City to be sent out. What used to happen was all of these goods would have to be shipped all the way up into Canada and back down if we wanted them to go on river. The Erie Canal, this man-made river, makes it much easier to connect New York City and the factories. So go ahead and watch this little um, diagram of how a canal works. So a canal is a man-made river where it makes it very easy for the water level to rise and fall as needed. So the boat's coming in, the gates will close, and the water will fill. As the water fills over time, eventually this gate will open and the boat can keep moving. So now we can move upstream like magic. All right, so this is a big part of the American system that had started under Madison. It was first proposed by Henry Clay to help connect the North, the South, and expanding Western territories. Um, we are internally improving our country. And through this, we are going to um, develop free enterprise. Free enterprise is going to grow. Capitalism is going to grow. Our economy is going to boom. It improves our infrastructure. Add this to your notebook. All right. 
So what are the effects of the American system? John Quincy Adams is like, I have a brilliant idea. Now that it's easier for our stuff to make it to market, let's encourage to pe er, people to buy our stuff instead of other country stuff by adding a tariff in. A tariff is a tax on imports. The tariff of 1828 gets passed. The construction of the Erie Canal begins, the National Road expands, and we start being able to send our goods out. Free enterprise is going to grow within the United States, and the tariff is going to make the Southerners angry and make the Northerners happy. I'll talk about that in a minute. Add this to your notebook. All right, tariff of 1828 gets the nickname of the tariff of abominations. That's a negative thing. All of the red states are against, all of the green states are for, and all of the blue states have 60% opposition, but not enough to overrule it. We see a very obvious north-south divide over who supports the tariff of 1828. Congress passes this tariff, so we're taxing those imported goods, making American goods the preferable thing, but it means that everybody's having to pay more money. A tariff, um, a protective tariff is a tariff that's levied on imports to protect the domestic economy rather than raise revenue. Add this to your notebook. All right, so here's how the North feels about the tariff. They love it. They're like, this tariff is a great thing. All of our factories are in the North. People are going to buy our goods. We're going to make so much money. We're going to get rich. The South hates the tariff. The tar or they're like, uh, this tariff is an abomination. Terrible thing. We rely on these imported manufactured goods down here in the South. Now we're having to pay even more money. It's going to cost us a fortune. So the North loves it. The South hates it. Add that to your notebook. So what can we infer about what the artist is trying to convey here? We see manufacturing over here with the tariff doing wonderfully. They look like they're, you know, wealthy businessmen. And we see the agriculture, the farmers that are like, oh my gosh, this tariff has put me in the poorhouse. South felt like the law favored the North big time. And they were right. So let's talk about this word sectionalism. Sectionalism is whenever someone shows preference to only one part of the nation instead of the nation as a whole. It is the complete opposite of nationalism. Our nation starts to fracture. It grows, or sectionalism grows tremendously because of the tariff of abominations. In fact, the South comes this close to seceding. Let's talk about JQA's foreign policies because we'll come back to this idea when we have Jackson later on. JQA's foreign policies, none to mention. He doesn't do anything for us in terms of other countries. The only thing he does is that tariff that um, makes us not want to buy other countries' goods. Now, we've got the return of the Jackson. Oh, dear. What will happen when Jackson returns in 1828 to take on John Quincy Adams for a second time? He's coming back after that corrupt bargain. He's all upset. Will John Quincy Adams be able to secure the election for a second term? Tune in next unit to find out. Please go publish your digital notebook and submit your